You know, the whole time I kept waiting to read this book, I kept looking at this cover and feeling like I, there's something so familiar about it. I can't figure out what it is. I feel like I've seen it before. And I thought, you know, it's probably just Mike. There's lots of fantasy novels out there. I'm sure this isn't the only one that has a bunch of people on horses riding towards the reader, right? And then I really, really started thinking about it. I was like, wait a second. This is that Final Fantasy Tactics game that used to give me so much frustration in the early 2000s. And flash forward to today, and, uh, well... It kind of goes fits well together because of uh, frustration. Let's talk about it. Hey, what's up, bookworms and bridge burners? Mike back for another spoiler talk as we are continuing the Malazan channel read along. If you guys don't know, we are slowly going through all of Malazan Book of the Fallen by Stephen Erickson, all 10 books over the course of of two years. So check out that schedule if you want to join us because we are only on book two. It's not possible to think that you can catch up with the gaps in that reading schedule. If you guys are looking for stuff on Guardians of the Moon, I've got tons of coverage on the channel of Guardians of the Moon. I've got a non-spoiler talk. I've got a conversation with uh, Iskar Jarak, who runs a really, really great Malazan uh, channel on YouTube. And I've also got the two spoiler talks I did for that. Well over an hour of spoiler talk about that book. So if you're looking for uh, somewhat of a deep dive from a first time reader, maybe you'll find something that you enjoy there. But this is going to be for the, the prologue, book one, Raraku. I know I'm saying that wrong. And book two, Whirlwind. After that, not going to talk anything about it because I haven't read that far yet, guys. See, I'm stopping right there and I want to get these thoughts down on a spoiler talk before I decided to continue with the series, and I want to continue with the series ASAP, so I'm going to go ahead and get these down. If you're curious about the uh, the, the, the change here, uh, technical problems. Watch my weekly update from Friday, and you'll understand why this happened. But uh, just know that it is temporary. Uh <laughs> Anyways, let's get into it. Let's talk some spoilers for uh, books one, two, and the prologue of Gardens of the Moon. Dead House Gates. Man, we're just starting off on fire here, aren't we? I feel like there's five very distinct groups in this book. Uh, traveling parties, if you will. So I'm going to kind of divide them up by that. And I think those are Icarium, uh, Felicen, Doiker. I'm saying Doiker, Fiddler, and Kalam. That's your five major uh, focus groups, I think you'd say, in this book. So I'm going to kind of talk about each one of those and kind of the things that I liked and didn't like about each one of those. And of course, the things I didn't understand. Now, guys, remember that I am a first-time reader here. I'm not asking for you to answer these things for me. If it's a read and find out, I'd like to read and find out. It's just kind of uh, progressing my, 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 chronicling my progress through this series, you know, and uh, just getting some conversation out there and go back to look at them like I did with my old Wheel of Time videos. And see if I find them funny in hindsight. But let's start off with Felicen. I, I, I'm saying Felicen, uh, Felicen sometimes. I don't know. It changes, guys. With me, with some of these character names, I say them differently multiple times when I'm reading them. Uh, I don't audio, so I'm probably going to say some of these things wrong. But uh, again, I, I hope that doesn't bother you too much. Uh, since this is where the prologue starts, I'm going to start with her. Uh, Gano's sister, if I recall correctly, I believe she was just mentioned in Gardens of the Moon. We didn't actually... Uh, see her. She might have been when he went back to the estate in Unta. Uh, but I, I want to say one of the epigraphs was by her. Uh, I, I don't know. I remember I remember seeing that name before. So it was like, okay, cool. That, that, that's cool to see that. But uh, yeah, I, one of those things, it's like, wow, so how much time has actually passed here? Because I feel like um, what, Lauren just passed away when we last read and Tavor is already the new adjunct to the Empress. So it's like, how much time really has went by here? And the fact that... Uh, you know, her, her sister is a big part of uh, what's going on with her. Uh, it, it, I think in this world, it, under the rule of Lacine, it's very tough to be a noble, I think, because it seems like uh, every couple of years we're like, mm, you know, it's time for a good calling. You know, nobles, everybody, it doesn't really matter who it is. And that's when we're introduced to uh, Aboric and Baudin, also on like this uh, chain gang with her. And I think this is one of the most gruesome scenes that I have ever read in any book. And this is coming from a guy who's read a lot of grim, grim dark fantasy here. Uh, the scene where Bowden takes the one noble and basically decapitates her using his chain to, to please the mob is, again, it's, it's one of those things where I'm like, I don't know how when people say, oh, it's not grimdark because the series has a lot of compassion in it. Well, it ain't happening yet. <laughs> and that was, yeah, that was definitely one of the most gruesome things I've ever read. But it, I think it kind of captures the madness of things, something like that. 
uh, quite well, and I'll get to Boat on in a second here. But um, I, I just want to say about each character here with Felicen, uh, I'm not part of the fuck Felicen crowd. I know that that's a pretty big contingent of Malice on Fandom that's like, you know, fuck her. Um, look, I, I can kind of sympathize with her, obviously. I mean, she's 15, yeah. She was a noble. I don't, I don't think that that makes you a bad person. I'm not one of those. Uh, but uh, it, 15 years old and to go through the trauma that she's going through right now, I mean, she's basically having to use her body to stay alive, basically. Yes, there is lots of rape. There is lots of uh, doing that just to kind of try to help you and your friends kind of thing. At least that's how she views it. And, and look, I won't lie, her still kind of like pining for her abuser, uh, drug abuser and sexual abuser, yeah, it makes me kind of sick. But uh, I, I got to think that it, who's not going to become quite damaged after enduring something like that, you know? And sure, she's still got some of that nobility uh, kind of entitlement in her. So uh, she isn't probably the best traveling companion. Like I know that there's... Uh, one part where they're telling her she's wet and they're telling her not to use the blankets because they have to use those to sleep with. And she's like, I'm, I've got to use them. <laughs> uh, again, I, I, there's some some brat things that, that come out with her. But I, again, I, it, you got to think about what this character has gone through. And in her eyes, you know, she was basically selling her body off to help her friends here and they act like they don't even care. And there's one part where they're they're having the, the breakout and Aboric's basically like, oh, we were thinking about just leaving you here because this seemed like a paradise for you. And I was like, wow, dude, that's... That, it's fucked up right there. Uh, but let's talk about how Boric here. Um, the stuff with the boar god is... I don't even know. Whenever you start talking about gods in a sentence in this, uh, my eyes just start to glaze over a little bit. <laughs> so I'm like, I, I know I'm not going to understand it, so why am I even going to try here? But uh, that stuff is just out there and, and very strange. Uh, with Bowden, I feel like there is very, very clear clues that I think this guy's a claw assassin or something. He's definitely not just some brute like he came off uh, in the prologue. Uh, he definitely knows some things like uh, when uh, after they had that whole jade statue thing I think in a Borg touch his, his arms were they're talking about you got, you got to put his arms on his body. It seems like he knows a lot of stuff that uh, you know just the average brute isn't going to know uh, when, when Felicen tries to like sexually seduce him just so she can kill him. He knows it's coming. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe I, I just see a lot of the similarities uh, somewhat with Kalam there, and that he always seems like he's a step ahead in these things. So it's just making me think, okay, this guy's, I think he might be a claw. Plus, he's carrying that little talon thing. That makes me think that maybe this is like, I don't know necessarily that that's like a sign of being an assassin. I just don't know what else it could be, you know? And it just seems like uh, Baudin and Haboric are always just kind of whispering off to the side. So uh, I think they both know a lot more than they let on. Obviously, Aboric is very important because. You know, Deutscher's making this big, big deal about going to rescue him. So, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but like I said, with this section, when you start talking about giant jade statues and ghost hands and things, don't know. Don't know at all. But I do love a good prison break and, uh, you know, from a slave camp. It, 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 was, it was fun. It was fun, especially when it's in the middle of a rebellion. I thought he captured the madness of something like that really, really well and how it just slowly escalates and then, boom, powder keg. It just explodes. And uh, but the the part with the whole like the magic ship with like the the headless thing you blow the whistle and the headless corpses would start rowing the boat man that is so out there but that's kind of what I'm loving about this series at this point is just how Erickson just kind of goes for it he doesn't seem like he holds back on much at all he just really goes for it and uh, that that continues here uh, the Talani Moss kind of show up uh, a couple of random ones. I don't really understand. They just kind of there for like a quick cup of coffee. And they're like, hey, by the way, uh, you guys are fucked. And then they leave. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I caught any of that at all. But uh, I was hoping that my guy Tool would show back up. Because uh, at this point, you're introduced to so many new characters. You're starting to be like, is this the same series? And I knew that going in. I knew that going in. But let's talk about some of those. Fiddler, uh, his group here. Uh, with Fiddler, I feel like if there is a sequel to the Gardens of the Moon, it's with this group right here. Uh, because you, you at least know who these characters are, uh, somewhat why they're here. You know, uh, Crocus, I'll flip that coin 
over the side of the boat. So the Crimson Guard, I guess they said, peace. And because at first I was like, why? What, what happened to the Crimson Guard? I thought they were like watching the coin bearer, you know? And, and, and I asked my guy Orion on the Discord server about that. I was like, hey, did, I, did I miss something? He's like, no, as soon as he like ditched that coin, they're like, see you later. I said, oh, okay. Uh, I mean, I kind of thought that, but I wasn't really exactly sure if it worked like that. I thought it was just one of those things that, yeah, you can flip it overboard and then you know what? The next day you're going to wake up, it's going to be in your pocket again or something. I don't know. I don't know what I was expecting with that coin. But I, I thought it would come out uh, somewhere in there. But while they're traveling over the ocean, I got to say, one of the coolest part is uh, Fiddler using the uh, Moranth Munitions, I think they're called, and just blows the shit out of that sea serpent. Who was communicating with them telepathically? Uh, soul, di soul, soul Taken and is it Divers? I mean, I, I get uh, Soul Taken, I believe, is uh, a shapeshifter. And uh, a diver is like uh, same thing, but you can go into like multiple creatures. A soul taken is just like one one physical species or being or something like that. And I think the divers is like multiple, like a, like a group of rats or a group of leopards, things like that. I, I don't know, but a lot. I mean, he's really, really going all in on the soul taken and the divers in this. And I'm just like, all right, all right. But uh, yeah, yeah, feather uh, using the uh, the explosives there is really really cool. I'm not going to lie, though, with this group. It's, it's kind of confusing to me. I don't really understand what their point is. It's like the whole time, it's like every time we check back in with them, it's like, okay, they're just kind of traveling from place to place. They get into some shit, they fight, and then they leave, and then it comes back to them, and the same thing happens again. I'm just like, sort of thinking about it. It's like, I have no idea what they're trying to do right now because, you know, they first get there, and it's like, okay, it starts really good. We're going to assassinate Lacine. I'm like, all right. This sounds like a good little plot. And then Kalam's like, peace, see you later. And it's like, okay, well, what, are the, what is this rest of this group doing you know, right now? I don't really even understand what they're doing. And I, I don't think it's until later you find out that you know we're trying to find the whole Azath house thing from Guards of the Moon, like I guess a companion to it. Guys, Azath stuff, closest thing I can figure is it's like a Stargate or like a fast travel point. You can travel between two places really fast. I guess, I don't know, but I, I think it wasn't until, uh, you know, Fiddler was really, really fucked up that he's telling him, oh yeah, that's what we're trying to do. And I'm like, is that what they've been trying to do the whole time? Because I've been really confused about what they've been actually trying to do. But like I say, the best part about this section was the whole revelation of Kelvin is Shadow Throne and Dancer is Cotillion. I said in the last one that uh, nobody, no dead when it comes to sci-fi and fantasy. And I didn't think we ever saw uh, actual corpses for Kelvin and Dancer. So I thought maybe they were still alive. Didn't think it was quite like this. Still not sure how the ascending thing works. Are you able to just like leave your physical body at any time and ascend? I don't, I don't know these things yet. But that still was a very good uh, uh, reveal. Not anything I'd say that I was like, oh my god, boom, or something like that. Because I, I think it... Yeah, thinking back on it with Guardians of the Moon, it's like, well, it is kind of, uh, you know, they did kind of mention that that's right when this whole, like, House of Shadows shows up or something. If I recall correctly, I might be wrong on that. But, uh, no, it wasn't anything that I figured out. But it's still, it was a cool, cool uh, reveal there. Uh, I also kind of like Fither's kind of somewhat crushing on Absalar. I, I think he thinks it's a... Uh, Two things he thinks. Well, and that's well, that's Crocus's girl. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not gonna be a dick. And then second one, he's like, uh, yeah, she also is probably still got a, a big old uh, stabby assassin inside of her kind of thing. So, um, but I guess she's just very attractive, you know. So the heart wants, but the heart wants Fiddler. Go for it, buddy. Shoot your shot. In the end, I like these characters. I just, I'm just unsure about kind of this subplot. But I do like that it, now at this point. I was struggling a lot with understanding where all these groups were on this continent because, guys, I've been trying to follow the map, and I, I don't know. I don't know. Look, the maps on this, look, they're like this big in my book, and also uh, not everything is listed, you know? So uh, I just finally gave up on that. I had no idea. I knew they were all near seven cities. I had no idea where or whatnot. So I had no idea that Akari and Mapo were anywhere near fiddler in the gang so uh when they actually meet up i'm like okay cool at least now it's went from five groups to four so at least we've got that settled down and that's a good place to switch into Akarium's group here Akarium and mapo like i like this portion a lot and i think it's because and i had a lot of people say wow, wow boss, you're not liking this part but you're liking this i like this as in like it is like in the guards of the moon way in that it's giving me little tidbits and enough to keep me interested but never at a point where i just feel like overwhelmed like i feel like i've got to go read a secondary book to understand what's going on right now there's a mystery like i don't i don't know what the hell the path of hands is i don't know who these nameless ones are but i'm interested in finding out i feel like he's laying that out 
in enough of a, a slow burn way that I'm still interested and intrigued to find out more. Um, you know, Akarium not being able to remember any of his past, oh man, it's a real thinker. I, I don't really know, especially when you got Mappo, who seems, uh, he seems to have nothing but memories that he likes to reminisce upon. And he knows a lot more. I think he knows a lot more about uh, Akarium's past, obviously, than we think. I think there's a reason that these two are together. But uh, I'm just glad we're seeing more uh, Jagut in this. Uh, I, I guess I was afraid in the last one that like the whole tyrant thing after he like left his body or whatever that was going to kind of be like the end of that. But even though he is, a, I think he's only a half breed. I don't know what he's mixed with. But uh, still, it, it's cool to see that character, and I kind of want to know more about that because it seems like uh, it's one part. It seems almost like he's almost like say almost like a, like a priest like he doesn't want to kill anybody but it turns out he's really good at the killing you know but then he doesn't remember that he's doing it so yeah yeah i'm i'm very much hooked want to know what that dude's deal is because um i'm very interested in that 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 buddy cop kind of kind of kind of comedy i don't want to say a comedy because it's not a comedy even though they try really hard with the Iskrol plus thing which i don't know i know that uh this is the the archaeologist side of Erickson coming out, where he likes to talk about how many paces it is to get to something. Uh, whenever Puss is telling them how to get somewhere, and he's telling them in paces, and it's just like, wow, wow. Okay, I feel like I'm uh, reading an Indiana Jones book at this point. But um, yeah, uh, I, I want to know more about these things, and obviously, uh, I, I think we'll get more of that now that we're with uh, mixed in with uh, with the group of Fiddler and his pals. That uh, maybe this will go in a direction that's going to give me some answers. Let's move on to Kalam here. Here's where things got super confusing for me early because, hey, we're going to assassinate the scene. Let's go. Okay, see you guys later. I got to go like give this book to some character I have never heard of until five seconds ago. And now why is this book super, super important? Uh, it's it kind of like, all right, I already felt like Fiddler and this group, including Kalam, were on a side quest. And now this feels like a side quest to the side quest. And I'm not sure I understood exactly why. And look, guys, I went into this knowing you're not going to understand everything. I'm okay with that. I'm just telling you, that can be a little frustrating at first. Look, if you say you read these books and you have zero frustration, wow, you are operating on another level than I am. There's going to be frustration. That doesn't mean I'm not enjoying something. It just makes something frustrating because there are certain parts where, uh, we'll talk about them when I get the Doikers part here, that it's just like, wow, info dump city. And with this, I feel like every other page I'm learning, okay, well, this character is a part of this group, and they're, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're joined by this character and this character and this character. Who joined from this rebellion that did this during this one uprising of this one time that this city fell under the rule of something because of blank? I'm like, all right, you just went so far back in history now. I don't know what's going on presently and what is history. <laughs> and so, yeah, it can be frustrating sometimes. Uh, especially we start talking about what uh, is it Shay Shaik? Is that how you say her name? Shaik? Whatever. Okay, wow, we've got her across this desert now and we've given her this book, and then two minutes later, she takes a crossbow bolt to the head. Like, so what was the point of all this? But um, I don't know. Apparently uh, uh Mapo and Akarium have to witness her ascension or something. I, I'm not sure, guys. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> I think the best part to come out of all of this is Aptorian. Uh, you guys, if you've watched my Robin Hobb or my uh, John Gwynn's Faithful in the Fall and stuff, you guys know I love me some animal companions or animal-ish companions. That's what Aptorian very much is. Uh, look, I want Apt to be like the Oi of this series. That's a Dark Tower reference in case you don't know who Oi is. Uh, I, I love good animal companions. I think they round out any group uh, of characters, any quartet, if you will. And uh, I, at first, it was like App seemed kind of, or not Apt, uh, Kalam seemed very like standoffish of him. Like, oh, it's, I, it's, I, he thinks he might be a spy, so like that. But then, he, you know, he, they have a fight uh, with some some bandits, and, and he gets injured. And, and, and Kalam first calls him Apt. I'm like, oh, well, you just gave him like a little nickname. That's like giving a guy a dog for eight hours and telling him not to fall in love with it, you know. So uh, I think those two are are our besties now. And it might I might have read this wrong, but I kind of felt like. Um, Kalam's horse and after kind of like silently competing for his affection. <laughs> Anybody else get that? I don't know. Maybe that's just what I wanted to happen. Uh, it, it's kind of cool. But uh, you get more of Kalam just being a badass in this. You know, that's what I liked in Gardens of the Moon. I was like, I want to know more about this guy. He is a serious badass, but even more in this. I love this. The, my favorite quote in this book so far is where this band is talking about how they're going to go like uh, rob and raid and pillage and rape this, 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 this encampment 
of people with women and children and stuff. And Kalam just kind of like, he kind of plays along and, and he's like, the bandit's like, oh, we're, we're going to give him a big surprise. And Kalam, so cold, just like, yeah, I've got a bigger surprise. Just slices his neck. I'm like, Fuck yeah. It's easy to see why people love this guy. But uh, yeah, he kills like eight people in two minutes and talks about how fast he can reload a crossbow. Just a boss move. And you know, I, I think it's, it's just, again, just really, Erickson's writing of action is just so good. Uh, I, I really felt like, it was realistic in the fact of how he took out all those guys. You know, there was the, he wasn't like the, like, like most movies you'll see like that. Oh yeah. He took out these eight guys and he didn't even break a sweat. No, it's a battle. He actually takes some punches and some hits and stuff like that. It's just really well written. Again, it made me think of the Ocelot fight in the last book and, and, and Ralik Nam really good, really good. Just pace by pace of what's going on in a fight. Erickson's one of the best of these that I've seen in a while. And then you got the girl, uh, is it Manala, Manila? I, I can't think of her name. Uh, she seems really into Kalam, and Kalam is just like way too fucking cool for school. He's just like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so uh, it's hard not to root for Kalam because he just seems like the coolest guy in the galaxy, you know. So uh, uh, I, as much as that 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 his segments kind of confused me, I think having a prior attachment to him and adding an animal companion made that one of my more favorite parts in that. And I really felt like with that Torian is when the book started to turn around for me to like, all right, look, I'm overly frustrated. Like, okay, I'm having a good time now, and that's that's all I wanted. Uh, but uh, you want to talk about frustration? Let's talk about Doiker. Um, is it Duker? Is it Dukier? Is it Diker? I don't know. I'm saying Doiker. Saving the best for last, am I right? Uh, look, my early criticisms of this book all came from Doiker chapters. Uh, I'm, I'm look. I'm interested in Coltane and the Wiccans. Uh, earlier with Coltane, I kind of got like a Kaladin Brood kind of comparison. Everybody's telling me how awesome this guy is, but I was afraid we weren't going to see it. We finally actually do see it uh, with Coltane there towards the end of book two. But uh, uh, yeah, I'm very interested. And I love the fact that like he used to be part of a rebellion. Now they've actually like hired him to like take over and help. That's that's, that's a really interesting twist. But uh, it seems like he's very methodical and a very good uh, leader. So uh, I want to see more of that. But uh, yeah, with Doiker's chapters, what I don't like is I feel like, again, like I talked about earlier, uh, where it just feels like it throws so much at you at once. So many lands and regions and, and, and groups and history and, and kings and queens and just everything that you can think of. Oh, this person used to be with this person, and then that person didn't like this person anymore because they betrayed them and slept with their wife, and then they did this. And then it's just like... what. Like I said, it's like reading the Silmarillion sometimes. It just seems like, okay, you're going backwards, and I'm starting to wonder, where's the line between your... Because you're introducing me all these new characters so fast. And then you're talking about all these historical characters. I'm trying to think, who is actually here right now? And who is just being referenced in this historical significance? So... I know it's one of those things I gotta let go of and just go with the flow. And I felt like I did that really good with Guardians of the Moon, but with this right away, it was just like, all right, I feel like if I just let all these characters go, they're gonna pop back up in like book six. I'm gonna be like, who? Who is this? You know? So I'm trying my best to kind of stick with some of them. I think I figured out who the most important ones are. Sormo Enath. Now that's a fun name to say. That's just a cool name, right? That's a really neat idea, but I won't lie. It took a couple of chapters for me to really wrap my head around that character right there, and I'm still, I'm still not sure I got it all. Uh, I like Culp. I feel like he is my Tattersill replacement, except he doesn't sleep with everyone he comes into contact with. <laughs> I mean, at least not on page. I mean, you don't know what he's doing, you know, off the page. You have no idea. He might be, he might be a real womanizer off page. Who knows? Uh, but um, yeah, I just think Doiker is the least interesting character in his chapters. I think he's about as interesting as watching grass grow. And I know that that's a historian. That's the way that he's probably written on purpose. It's just not, it's just not interesting for me to read. Like, I mean, I think it's in chapter 10, there's like one section where it's 15 pages of arguing about cattle crossing a bridge. Now, look, I know refugees are going to be a big part in a war and rebellion like this. That's fine. I get that. It's kind of like what I said with the heroes by Joe Abercrombie. I know that with a lot of war is just sitting around and waiting. I don't want to read about it. You know, it's like, just tell me, hey, they waited for three days. You don't have to describe those three days for me. Uh, with this, I felt like it could definitely have used a scalpel here. And that was the first time I felt like that. I never felt like that in Guards of the Moon. I never felt like there was anything that needed to be cut out. This, I wouldn't say cut out, but I, I felt like it could have been trimmed down. I mean, yeah, we get our big battle. And then look, it's really cool. Again, Erickson continues to write great action. Some absolutely crazy crazy shit that made me think of like the siege of pale with uh with nil like summoning zombies that was a nice little uh a wrinkle there i think um 
You know, again, I go back to the Grimdark thing. I, I know Erickson dropped in my Guardians of the Moon review and said I do not write Grimdark. Are you sure? <laughs> I mean, are you sure? Because I think at one point there's a, a sapper, I can't remember his name, but he blows up a shitload of clusters and he talks about how it's just like raining blood and guts for a few minutes. It's like, this, dude, even my guy Joe doesn't go here. What what in the world? Yeah, not, not Grimdark. Okay. I know people get so crazy about these subgenres to so the subgenres here, but it's just like, this is some of the darkest shit I've ever read. You know, I mean, uh, I think Robert Jordan kind of did that a little bit in, uh, what was it, Lord of Chaos at Dumais Wells with a little bit of like, a, like talks of describes a meat grinder. But, you know, he didn't describe, describe it quite as much as Erickson does here. So uh, if it's not Grimdark, I do will say that, um, I do will say, you like that? I feel like Erickson definitely is not afraid to get his hands dirty. Let's put it that way. You know, so I feel like right when this chapter is starting to get good, it goes off on this tirade about the Simic, who I'm like, I don't even know who these people are. I, I thought I understood who, who Coltane and the group were fighting, and then like this random tribe shows up out of nowhere. I'm like, did I miss a chapter? I feel like that a lot. Did I miss a chapter? Uh, the Simic, and then we talk about like this, this Simic Ascendant who's like trapped in ice, and I am a giant confused question mark, you guys. I didn't understand any of this stuff that was going on at all. This is one where I'm just going to roll with it. Uh, I know apparently the Jagut uh, use ice uh, with their magic or something. And then I started thinking, hmm, memories of ice. Oh, I wonder if that's, a, you know, kind of a, a little bit of foreshadowing. But look, I'm not understanding this enough, nearly enough, to start talking about theories or foreshadowing. Uh, in the end, guys, I, I think that the Thelicens group's been my favorite bit of the book. It's enough of... Just being able to relate to to characters that are, are really struggling through a tough time. It's a bit bleak in the muck. I don't mean like late because, look, I ain't had to go through anything like that. Uh, most of us haven't, if we're being honest. But uh, I think that, what I mean by that is it's, it's something that, that I really genre that I like. I love Grimdark, and it really feels very Joe Abercrombie and that it's, like I said, bleak, hopeless, in the muck with the characters. I kind of feel like that's how you are with them where it just feels hopeless and uh, I'm really enjoying that. And then and the magic the magic ship stuff is very, very intriguing. I want to know what the heck is going on with that. Uh, but look, folks need to relax on the, well, Mike is hating this book because I had some criticism. You guys have got to pump the brake on that. Uh, when you're on the Discord and you're reading my instant thoughts, uh, you're going to hear some things that may not sound like praise. Look, guys. If I'm not enjoying the book, I'll tell you. I'm enjoying the book just fine. I'm not liking it as much as Guards of the Moon, but I didn't expect to, you know, because Guards of the Moon got a lot of comparisons to Dune. And you know what? The whole Desert Rebellion thing, lots of comparisons to Dune there, too. So I'm seeing things that I like in both of these. I just, I'm just not liking the characters as much as I like the ones in Guards of the Moon. I like plenty of them, or I may not be as invested in some of them, as in, like, some of them could get, psh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be upset. But, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that I just, like, don't care about any of them. I might have felt like that early on because I was just frustrated. But, again, you guys got to take it easy with the, oh, well, Mike hates this book. It's not like that at all. You got to understand instant criticism is just that, instant criticism, before you have time to think or get a little further in the book. And I know that a lot of people have read this full series and they're thinking, hey, well, you know, I'm so dear to these characters, or I know what they go through or where they end up at the end of this, so it's hard for me not to look at it. Remember, I'm a first-time reader, guys, and ask yourselves, did you feel similar the first time you read this? Uh, but uh, again, I, I like that this does feel so different from Guardians of the Moon, believe it or not, because I think it makes the world feel bigger in a more organic way. I don't feel like he's trying to shove anything in there. Uh, I really, really like that. And uh, I'm interested to see where it keeps going because I think that if you're going to build a world as big as he's building, this is definitely the way to do it. I think if Erickson had tried to put uh, Genobacchus and Seven Cities all in one book, it would have been a convoluted mess. It would have been like 1,500 pages. And it would have been so much information you wouldn't be able to handle it. So if he's going to continue to build this world, I think that's the best way to do it is by separating it by volume. It's probably the best way to do it. And then immediately, you know, eventually... Convergence. That's that's what I'm hoping for. You know, I know it's one and three, two and four, and then five is like its own thing. And then I'm hoping six through ten is kind of like the convergence of a lot of these crossover of a lot of these characters. So, guys, that was spoiler talk number one. I expect to do spoiler talk number two on the fifteenth. That will be two weeks from today, and then the non-spoiler review will be on the 29th and then look for my wrap up of this as we put this one to bed i'll be having my malazan veteran conversation with philip chase a booktuber that i absolutely love i love the way that he talks about books check him out if you guys have not i will link his channel 
But we'll be doing that on the 31st as we put this one to bed and start looking forward to Memories of Ice, many of Malazan fans' favorite books. So interested to see what is on the horizon since everybody keeps telling me that the second half of Dead Hell Gates is even better than the first. So uh, we shall see, guys. So uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Please, no spoilers for books three and four or the epilogue of this book or obviously anything after that as uh, you know, a lot of people that are joining the read-along are not past this point yet. So uh, I appreciate you, guys, appreciate you guys watching, and I hope to talk to you in the comments.